That was such a nice introduction. I'm not sure where to go from 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 here. But, um, I want to say good afternoon to everyone, and um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here to give the Daniel Thurs lecture. So I first want to um, just say that you know when I was when my team and I were doing research about Daniel Thurs, I was so impressed by his life and what he stands for and everything that he's done not just for the school, not just for social work, but really when it comes to elevating issues of poverty, inequality, social justice, disparities, these issues that I think are in the lifeblood of the core of, of, of what we do. And I was also looking at the, um, the other people who had these keynotes before and talk about big shoes to fill. I see Nick Kristoff came to talk before, Donna Shalala, Kurt Schmoke, and so I'm really honored to, to, uh, to be here today. I now um, recognize from what Dee Bart said that, um, that, that, uh, that Dean Thurst was quite a large individual, so I'm not sure I can quite fill those shoes, but, um, but I'm very honored to be here. And um, want to acknowledge also Professor Michael Reich, who, as you heard, is nationally renowned for, um, for, uh, for advocacy for everything he does on issues of poverty and equality and welfare, and very grateful to, to, to be here and to meet uh, Dr. Reich in person. And of course, Dean Barth. Um, I have the opportunity to work with Dean Barth and with many of the faculty in the School of Social Work on quite a lot of collaborations. Actually, a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today, um, whether it's around trauma and mental health or children's welfare or healthy babies. Um, actually, I just came from a steering committee meeting for Be More for Healthy Babies, and Dean Barth and, um, and, and other members of your team are well represented there. So thank you so much for everything you, you do around the country um, as educators, but also critically right, right here in Baltimore as well. So I was thinking about what I should talk about today. And um, as I was driving through from downtown to here, I couldn't help but reflect on the different neighborhoods and the diversity of neighborhoods that we pass through. And we frequently talk about the statistic of this 20-year difference in life expectancy as you move from different neighborhoods in, in Baltimore. And I think we say this as a statistic so often, we don't think about what it actually means. I mean, what it means is a child born today, depending on what neighborhood he or she happens to be born in, can expect to live 65 years if they're born in one neighborhood, or 85 years if they happen to be born just a few miles away. And I think the incredible thing about this, I mean, there are many incredible things about that, that, about that statistic, but one incredible thing about it is it actually illustrates that health is not just about health care, because we live in the shadows of some incredible medical institutions, some of the best in the world. I mean, people fly from all over the world to get their medical care at Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, and Mercy, at Sinai. I mean, great institutions. So if what determines how long you live isn't about the medical care that you get, because it can't be, right? I mean, all these institutions are all here. If that's not it, then what is it? And that troubled me a lot as I was going through my medical training because I think it's actually quite humbling when you're going through your training to learn that what you're doing, what you're learning how, how to do, isn't actually what's going to determine the length of someone's life. Right? I mean, I think, you know, I went to medical school, I think people go to nursing school or social work school thinking that what you'll do makes that difference. But I remember seeing this one child when I was in my, um, in, in, uh, in my medical training, I'm, I'm an emergency physician, and so when you know someone very well in the ER, it's not really a good thing, right? Because it means that you've seen them a lot of times, and why are they in the ER so much? But um, I remember seeing this one child, and I got to know him really well. He was eight years old. And he came in over and over again with shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing, couldn't catch his breath. I mean, he had asthma, and he was always there for the same thing. And every time, medically, we would know what to do because this is, asthma is our bread and butter. We know what to do. We know to check his lungs, give him an inhaler, give him nebulizer treatment, sometimes steroids, and then he would feel better and he would go home. If we probed a little bit deeper, and just a little bit deeper, we would find out that often he was homeless. 
he and his mother were unstably housed, that um, they often went between different relatives' homes where everybody smoked. And that was certainly exacerbating his asthma. Sometimes also, they got housing somewhere. Maybe it was a shelter. Um, at some point, actually, they, they found they, were, they got housing in a row house. But the problem was that the row houses on both sides of where they lived were vacant. And even if their house was clean and they, we did housing re remediations in their home, still there were molds and allergens in the row houses next to them. And that's what was triggering his asthma. And I think that also adds to the humbly realization of what we do in medicine, that we can do all the medical interventions that are proven. They're evidence-based. We know that they work. But ultimately, what determines the quality of that child's life and why he kept on coming back to us wasn't about the medical care that we were giving, but also about all these other factors in his life. And I felt quite powerless, actually, as a medical professional to change those other factors in his life. I mean, we often say, and I think this is true, that housing is healthcare. But what was I, as a doctor, going to do to give this child housing? Um, so often, I remember my patients would come in saying that, or with many complications of various illnesses, chronic illnesses, for example, they might have heart disease or diabetes, and I would say, okay, you take these medications and you also have to change your diet. But my patient would say to me, well, in order to get to a grocery store, I have to take two buses and then walk 12 blocks. And Whole Foods, I just can't afford the food there. If I'm to go to my local store, the closest thing that comes to a healthy fruit or vegetable is a dried old banana that nobody wants and potato chips. I mean, when we look around in Baltimore City, one out of every three African Americans lives in a food desert without access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So how am I really being, how can I be genuine to my patients and say you should eat a healthier diet when they don't have that option readily available to them? So often we talk about this narrative of choice, but we have to understand that that choice is predicated on privilege. And it's that privilege that not everybody enjoys. Um, it's been said also that the currency of inequality is years of life. And if that's true, then the opposite of poverty becomes health. And so, you know, I think that I'm an optimist by, by, by nature, despite this rather pessimistic start to our lecture. <laughs> but um, I wanted to frame this conversation because I think these are the same issues that you see every day in your work. I mean, social work, you're on the ground, on the front lines every day. You see the issues that our patients struggle with. And I think so often we end up pointing to these problems, the statistics, and say, Things are just so complicated. I mean, it's, you know, I think it's, we say these issues are so big, where do we even begin? But what I want to do today is to explain how I believe that public health can help to level the playing field of, of inequality. That there are tangible steps that we can take because otherwise we spend so much of our time studying the problem. I mean, I'm all for data and science. I'm a researcher and scientist at heart. I totally agree with studying the problem so we know our baseline, so we know what the solutions are, so we know how we can make an impact. But I also am an emergency physician. And when a patient comes to me in the ER, that patient could be very complicated. Maybe we don't know what's going on with them. Maybe they're unresponsive, and you know, maybe they have a scar down here, and they look like they've had surgery, open heart surgery before. Maybe they're a cancer patient. We may not know exactly what to do because there are so many things going on. But it's never an option to say, this patient is too complicated. There are too many problems, so we're going to make it somebody else's issue. That's never, that's never an option. and so. The approach that I'm going to give you three ideas for the approach that we take from the lens of the, of the health department, which, as you heard, does a lot of things, including if you ever want to know what are the clean restaurants to go to, not necessarily the good restaurants, but the clean ones, you know who to call. Um, but um, I want to give you three ideas for how we, through the lens of public health, approach these larger problems.
And I would I want to make sure that I have plenty of time to hear your questions and other things. So I'll I already talk fast. So I'll try to talk extra fast to make sure that I have time for your questions. And then um, if you have comments or other things. You can save them for the end or throw pieces of paper at me to, to, to get my attention if you disagree. But um, let me, um, but um, I want to give you three ideas again because I think that's also in the spirit of, um, of Dean Thurs, who, as I understand, was never afraid to tackle the difficult problems and to try some things that may not always work on the first, the first time around, but I think overall encapsulate the principle of we have to do what we can now. So three ideas. The first is we believe in starting upstream as early as possible. So there's the story of the fable, if you will, of going upstream. And I relay this down because I think this captures the heart of what is public health. And this fable goes as follows, that there are three friends who are walking along a river with a very fast moving stream. And they see little children who are drowning. And the first person jumps in and starts saving these kids because you've got to save the kid in front of you, but there are more and more kids than he can possibly save. So the second person runs further upstream and sees a dam and says, if I could just repair this dam, then I can save these kids. And so he begins to try to repair this dam. And the third person keeps on running. The first two people call after him and say, why are you still running? We need to save these kids. And he said, I want to see who is throwing in the kids in the first place concept of going upstream is what we do in public health to start as early as possible. So uh, I mentioned to you that I just came from a meeting of the Be More for Healthy Babies Collaborative. Let me see who's heard of this program before. Basically, everybody has. So good, you can give this lecture instead. But, um, you know, I, I, I talk about Be More for Healthy Babies everywhere because I'm so proud of the work and I think it so encapsulates the principles of what we do in public health. So back in 2009, when Be More for Healthy Babies was first started, our city had one of the worst infant mortality rates in the country. And within a matter of seven years, we're not talking a long time, but within a matter of just seven years from 2009, we have cut the infant mortality citywide by nearly 40%. Nearly 40% by focusing on connecting women to critical services, getting prenatal care. I mean, we know, for example, that women who do not get prenatal care are five times more likely to have babies who die than women who do. Um, that program also focuses on home visiting because we strongly believe in going to where people are with credible messengers, trusted messengers who are from the communities that they serve. The program, by the way, also, um, not only does it focus on reducing infant mortality, which is an important goal, it also focuses on cutting disparities because we strongly believe that health disparities, that 20 year gap in life expectancy or whatever other disparity, that it bends the arc of justice and that we aren't going to be successful. I mean, this is, you know, health is not a zero sum game. It's not like if you improve the life expectancy in one group, it decreases in the other. It doesn't work that way. And actually, the healthier one group is, the healthier we all are because of infectious illnesses, because of, you can think of violence and many other factors too. So we strongly believe in cutting disparities. And within the seven years of Be More for Healthy Babies, we've also cut the disparities in the city in half in that period of time too. And so I talk about healthy babies because it's an example of going upstream, of helping all of our families thrive and succeed. And I think that that's, that is the key. That's the key of the work that we do. We believe in starting as early as possible. Home visiting programs, many of you may know the data for this, it not only improves the outcomes, the health outcomes for that baby, it also has effects even later on. That child who got home visits when they were a baby is more likely to graduate from high school. And it impacts the woman and the family as well, with many downstream effects too. So again, start, starting as early as possible. I'll give you an example of how we tie this into our work and our policy citywide. Um, you know, many of the problems that we face, whether it's improving education or reducing violence, are very complex. And we can't do everything. But there might be something simple that we can do. When I first came to, to the city and I started in my, in my job about three years ago, I asked many of our partners, 
what it is, if there's one intervention that you can do, what is that one thing? You know, what is that low hanging fruit that we haven't figured out how to do, but we can do, we just haven't done yet. And I heard something that actually really surprised me. The, what I heard for that one intervention was glasses. And I thought, glasses? I didn't understand why this was an issue, but this is what I learned, that in Maryland, state law requires for children to be screened for vision problems in pre-K, first grade, and eighth grade. So I wear contacts and, and glasses, but I see that some of you wear, wear glasses. Maybe some of you wear contacts too, but I can't really tell. Um, how many of you were diagnosed with vision problems between first grade and eighth grade? A lot of you, me too. I mean, I remember that I was looking at the board sometime in second or third grade, and it got blurrier and blurrier, and I thought it was normal. Because how would I know that it's not, right? I thought everybody, you know, there was some kind of lesson on maps or geography or something, and I couldn't see the map, but I thought maybe everybody squints, and that's just what, what you do. I mean, you, a lot of us get diagnosed with issues in that, in that period of time. But something else, too. Less than 20% of kids who are getting screened as needing glasses were actually getting them. So when you calculate this large gap that's missing between first and eighth grade and the fact that 80% of kids were not actually getting glasses, the estimate is between 15 and 20,000 kids in Baltimore City were not getting glasses who needed them. And I thought, I mean, talk about low-hanging fruit. I mean, again, I believe in research, but really, I don't need another study to tell me that if you can't see, you can't read. <laughs> Or maybe kids, maybe it's possible that a child may be labeled as being disruptive and may then be engaging in disruptive, even violent behavior and acting out when actually what they needed that year or two years back even was a pair of glasses. This to me is a solvable problem. Like infant mortality, it's a solvable problem. People have figured this out. It's called glasses. You know, there is a, there is a solution. And so we got together, this is about now a year and a half ago, we got together multiple partners in our city, Johns Hopkins to do the evaluation, for example. We got together Warby Parker, the glasses provider, a national nonprofit called Vision to Learn. And we said, we can figure it out. And so within now, this program has been in place for a year and a half. And uh, within three years, we're going to be able to get glasses and screenings to every child who needs them in every grade, K through eight, right in their schools through a mobile van without the child missing school and without the caregiver or parent missing work. And I believe we just handed out our 2,500 pair of glasses or something like this. There were over 2,000 pairs of glasses that are being handed out. And I have to say, this is one of the great joys of my work, um, to be able to go to see in these schools and these kids are picking up the glasses and saying, I can see for the first time. It really is a made for TV moment because, you know, these kids are really seeing a very different world for, for the first time and seeing their parents' re reactions and caregivers' reactions is really incredible. But, you know, I see getting glasses for kids, reducing infant mortality, providing services for our most vulnerable. I see these as upstream interventions for improving literacy for reducing violence. I see glasses, I mean, I know this sounds, you know, to other people, I, I think I'm preaching to the choir for social work, but when I talk to everybody else in our city, right, it seems like it often is a revelation of, wow, providing glasses is a violence reduction strategy. Re reducing lead poisoning is a violence re reduction strategy. That's the concept of going upstream and starting as early as possible. So that's our first principle in our work. Nobody's throwing papers yet, so I'm, I'll, start, I'll, I'll go on to the next thing, which is that our second principle is that we cannot just talk about the cost of an intervention. We have to talk about the cost of doing nothing. Um, to put it differently, I was at an event with Congressman Cummings yesterday where we were talking about the ACA and the importance of health care. And Congressman Cummings said, the cost of doing nothing isn't nothing. So I think it's a, fair, it's a fair statement. You know, you can, anyway, but um, I don't want to get into the politics of this, except I feel like I have to. 
Um, and I, and to, to this point, because I know this is something that many of us think about in our work, um, one of my mentors is, the, is now the dean of the, of, of the University of, of Maryland uh, School of Public Health at, uh, at College Park. This is Boris Lushniak. Um, he's a friend, colleague, and mentor. And he mentioned to me once that in this time, when we're thinking about how to talk about our work, maybe it's helpful to think about it as we can be political, but not partisan. And what I mean by this is you're, you're not going to hear me talk about Donald Trump this or that or Republican or Democrat this or that because I don't think it's helpful in our conversations. But I do think it's helpful in these conversations. And in fact, I can't avoid in our conversations talking about the Affordable Care Act. I mean, 40,000 people in Maryland, or sorry, in Baltimore, and 250,000 people in Maryland have health care because of the ACA. I can't do my job if I can't talk about the ACA. But by definition, if I say the word ACA, it's political because that's the nature of our discourse these days, but that's the nature of our work, right? That you can't, I can't talk about Medicaid without it sounding like policy and politics. But I also can't not talk about Medicaid when half of our pregnant women and our children are dependent on Medicaid and children's health insurance program. I can't talk about, I can't do my job if I don't discuss the impact of gutting Medicaid and what that would do for the residents that I serve. And so I thought for me that it's a helpful frame that we don't have to be partisan in our work, but we can be political and talk about the policy without being partisan. But um, I mentioned this because ACA has been in the news. And every time ACA is in the news or Medicaid is in the news, people talk about the cost of the program. But I also think we need to talk about the cost of nothing, of not doing anything. Because working in the ER, for example, I, I worked in the ER before and after the ACA. And I've seen my patients come in who come in with end-stage issues. I had a young man who came in in a seizure that took us an hour to break because he couldn't get he couldn't pay for his seizure medications. He couldn't pay for seizure medications because he was uninsurable, because he had a chronic condition and was priced out of health insurance. I mean, we have to talk about that. We have to talk about what is the cost of having him in an ICU rather than paying for seizure med medications and paying for insurance, right? I mean, what is the cost of this is a hundred thousand dollars of, of medical stay as opposed to $100 a month for his medications. I mean, we have to talk about that. It's not just the cost of the medications, it's the cost of doing nothing. I remember actually a patient that I had back in the pre-ACA days who had complications from diabetes, as many patients do. And she, and she said to me, look, I can get treated now because I have renal failure and I'm on dialysis. But before, I couldn't get primary care. Before, I didn't qualify for health insurance. I couldn't get health insurance to get my medications, but I now can. And she was telling me this as a story of, this is great, I now have health insurance. And I thought, what kind of healthcare system do we have? Well, we're asking people to come in when they have a life-threatening issue and we can now pay for that. And now, this patient has to go for, for dialysis three times a week. We can pay for that dialysis, but we couldn't, keep, we couldn't pay to keep her healthy in the first place. But anyway, I digress a little bit, you know, but um, I think that these are the stories that we have to be able to tell. We are on the front lines. We hear our clients, our patients tell us these stories. And I think at, these, at this time where things are politically charged or charged with partisan connotations, this is the role that we can play. Again, we're not being partisan, but I don't think that we'd be doing our jobs if we don't tell the stories that we see every day, the stories of our patients who encounter these challenges every day. And sometimes those stories can also be personal. And so I'll tell you one more about the cost of, of doing nothing. Um, you know, I, um, some of you may, may, may know, I know that Dean Barth knows, I'm a new mother. Um, I gave birth actually just 12 weeks ago. And um, so if, I, if you see me being a little bit, you know, looking like I've got babies spit up in different places, which I think I do on this shirt, but shouldn't have worn black today. But anyway, so but hopefully you'll, 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 you'll forgive me for that. But, um, you know, I was, um, 
Um, I'm a pretty healthy person, and um, I was my my husband and I have we love kids and we wanted to have kids, and I was we were so happy when I got pregnant, and I didn't know, actually, that I would have complications in my pregnancy because who plans to be sick? Right? I mean, nobody plans to have complications or illnesses. I'm really lucky that I have excellent health insurance. I'm really lucky that I have great access to health care. I'm really lucky to be privileged in so many ways, to be a physician. You know, I'm very lucky. And when my doctor recommended that I come in for frequent monitoring, for frequent ultrasounds and blood tests and, you know, and to stay in the hospital for observation at some point, I never thought about any trade-offs that I would have to make because I didn't need to do them. Again, choice is predicated on privilege, and I was privileged. I didn't have to make any trade-offs. And I thought a lot about because my pregnancy also coincided with the ACA and all the conversations about repealing the ACA. I kept on thinking about what kind of choices would I have to make if I were to decide between an ultrasound that may determine the life of this baby that I was carrying versus if I had to choose between that and food and rent for the rest of my family. I mean, I didn't have to make those choices and with Medicaid, you know, and with the access to healthcare that we now have, people don't have to make these choices, but if that were taken away, what would that really mean? And I say all of this because so often, you know, we talk about the cost of that intervention and oh, Medicaid is so expensive and oh, health insurance is so expensive and covering the AC is so expensive, but what is the cost of doing nothing? Um, and I think it's important, again, at this time that we speak up. And I'll add something else that someone once told me, which is that data, which is very important, data provide context, but it's stories that compel action. Data provide context, stories compel action. And so I think for all of us who are involved in both, that we're researchers, we're scientists, we know the data that's really important for us to tell them but also marry that with the stories that we see, that we hear every day. So don't just talk about the cost, but also the cost of doing nothing. Third, and here I'll speak about the importance of science here, because I feel like I've been saying we don't need research, which is not true, but we do need research. And my third principle is that we have to fight stigma with science. You know, one, of the, um, one of the things that we do a lot with in our city because this issue ties into every aspect of our work and um, of public health is around addiction. In our city, there are 21,000 people who use heroin, many more who may have addictions to other substances, including alcohol and benzodiazepines and cocaine and other things. And we had more people in our city die, actually twice as many people in our city die from overdose last year than died from homicide. Both are big problems. We should have attention to both, but we need to put a lot more focus around the disease of addiction and see it as a disease, which is what science tells us to be true. But the stigma that's around addiction is incredible. Um, I did the blanket prescription. So two, two years ago now, I issued a blanket prescription for, for, for Narcan or Naloxone in our city. And um, the idea is that everybody should be able to save a life. I mean, this is really a no-brainer, right? If people are dying at epidemic numbers and there is an antidote, we should make this antidote available to everyone because we have to save the person in front of us who's dying. But the types of comments that I got when I issued that blanket pre pre prescription, I think you can imagine some of them. And some of them were, well, why would you give it to those people? Is it a waste of resources? Um, is it just going to make people use more drugs? Do we ever say to someone who is dying from a peanut allergy, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you an EpiPen because it might make you eat more peanuts next time? We don't say that. We don't say to somebody who comes in many times because of an asthma exacerbation, well, you shouldn't be treated for your asthma. Right? I mean, we, obviously, that's, that would be an inappropriate thing to say. But we stigmatize the disease of addiction and view it very differently than we do any other illness. And we have to change that. And part of how we do that is through the lens of science. And I think it's important for all of us in this room, as scientists, to call it out and say, addiction is a chronic brain disease. That 
what we have to do now if somebody's overdosing is give them Narcan because that saves someone's life while they're overdosing now. Same way if, if somebody's having a heart attack and we have defibrillators available in public places, right? We, we have to save this person's life now. But that they require long-term treatments too. And that that long-term treatment works. It exists. It works. That recovery is possible. That there are millions of people around the country who are testament to the fact that recovery is possible. And that's important for all of us to tell, to share that story, and to fight stigma with science. I would be remiss, though, if I were to address the issue of addiction without relaying something that's been said to me multiple times in our city, which is I remember that you know our governor, um, as you know, declared a state of emergency around opioids. President Trump recently called it a public health emergency. There was no funding attached to it, so that's a different story. We can talk about that later. Uh, cost of doing nothing, right, isn't nothing. But, um, the, um, but I was at a community meeting where um, somebody stood up, and it was very poignant. And I repeat this. Some of you may have heard me say this before because it, it, just, it was one of those moments where this person stood up and said, you need to explain to me why we have a state of emergency around, around opioids now because there have been people in the city dying from heroin, cocaine, right, with a crack epidemic. There have been people dying for decades. Why is this suddenly a state of emergency? And I think it needs to be said that, you know, on the one hand, it is true that people are dying in much larger numbers than ever before around the country, but it also needs to be said that when addiction was seen as an issue that afflicted poor minorities in inner cities, that addiction was seen as a choice. So therefore, if you end up in jail or dead, you made a bad choice. It was a moral failing on your part. And now that the epidemic affects white people in suburban, in rural, in wealthy areas, that suddenly addiction is a disease. I mean, I think it needs to be said. You know, it's uncomfortable to say it, but I think we have to call it out. Because we are the ones who also have to call out, you know, it's, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be fair, we wouldn't be honest with ourselves if we didn't address the racial inequities of our past and present. And if we didn't call out the fact that we have gotten to where we are in part because of structural inequalities, because of structural racism, if, if we don't call out that, racism also is a public health crisis. And I strongly believe that you know, it's part of our job, and again, our third principle is that we're fighting stigma with science, but part of fighting that stigma is acknowledging where we came from and not being afraid to call out the problems that we see. I will say that none of this that I'm asking for us to do, right, these three approaches that we take and the three approaches that I urge for all of us to take, none of this is easy. But none of us went into our work because it's easy. I'm pretty sure when you first decided that you were going to, you were going to go into social work, nobody said, oh, that's such an easy profession. <laughs> or um, social justice. Nobody who does work in social justice would expect that it's easy. And sometimes, again, we look at these big problems because all these issues are interrelated, right? My patient with asthma, for me to help this patient with asthma also involves housing, also involves addressing poverty. I mean, these are huge issues. But it can never be an option for us to say, it's too complicated. It's somebody else's problem. Let somebody else do it for me because it's our job to start now and to do what we can. So I'll end with this. Um, because, um, you know, I think that, especially at this time, sometimes we feel like we're taking one step forward, two steps back, or, you know, we, we feel like there's this giant barrier that we have to overcome. And sometimes the work that we do feels really hard. And it often feels like we may be creating trouble by doing it. But Representative John Lewis, civil rights icon, and Congressman John Lewis, talks about how there is good trouble and bad trouble. And good trouble is when we stand up to injustice. And so faculty and students and alumni and friends and fellow social justice leaders, I hope that you'll join me in this mission for social justice, to call out the problems that we see, to go upstream and to start as early as we can, 
and to talk about the cost of doing nothing. Because I do believe that of all times, this is our time. This is our time to stand up and do the right thing and to fight for these principles that we hold so dear. So again, thank you for the honor of being invited here to give the Daniel Thurs Lecture, and I now look forward to your comments. So well, I know that there are, we have time for four, four questions. A few, Bef a few questions, we... and we have to use the mic as this is being broadcast. So they won't hear us your questions unless we use the mic, so. As we do questions, yes. if I can introduce quickly, this is Leah Hill, who is my, who is a Baltimore Co Fellow with the Health Department. Lizzie is also here, who is shadowing us, and um, <laughs> they will be, they're, they're going to be circulating a sign-up sheet for anybody who's interested in finding out more about the work of, of the Health Department, as we're doing uh, our, our questions and answers as well. And the first question is right here. Thank you, Dr. Wen. Um, thanks to your effort, uh, there's a blanket prescription for naloxone throughout Baltimore. So anyone in this room could walk into a pharmacy and ask for it and be given with instructions by the pharmacist. However, these are difficult times with an epidemic that requires, I think, more. Um, social workers cannot distribute medications. It's clear this is not part of their uh, scope of practice. However, during an epidemic like this, uh, should social workers be permitted to carry naloxone and distribute it in high-risk areas where many are working and have the most intimate contact with people who are at risk for uh, death and the effects of the opioids? That's a terrific question, and I was pulling out of my, my bag because it's time for show and tell. <laughs> no, it's, um, no, but I, I bring this with me everywhere because I wanted to show what, what naloxone looks like. I've got the other, there's our, there are two versions of it. One is an intramuscular version. This is very similar to an EpiPen, right? It's given intramuscularly. And the other version is a nasal spray that looks almost like Flonase, right? That you just you, you spray it in, uh, in the nose. I bring it here to illustrate how easy it is to use. And people who, who are nodding, I, I, I think you can see that, 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 it's easy, that it's easy to use. To your point about the blanket per prescription um, and who should be allowed to carry it, I strongly believe that every single person in our city should carry naloxone in their medicine cabinet, in their first aid kit, and have it available to them. I will explain also to your question about who to distribute it. So two years ago, we got the legislation changed in Maryland uh, le le legislature so that, um, so that because of my blanket prescription, as long as you go through a basic training, you can get access to this medication and carry it with you. We got the training to be as easy as possible. I mean, even to the point that it could be done within two, uh, within two minutes on a street corner, which we did. We did over 30,000 trainings, um, including on street corners. Um, but we still realized, to your point, that that's an impediment because if you have to prove that you have a training in order to get the medication, and only certain people can do trainings, then it's one more step, right, that, 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 that's an impediment to getting, to, to getting people the, the medication. We got the law changed further so that as of this October, as in last month, and then, uh, naloxone is essentially available over the counter so that you, my blanket prescription now, is, now does not have the training requirement. So you can go into any pharmacy and, uh, in Baltimore City and under my blanket prescription, you can get this, um, you can get Narcan. Um, about outreach also, as far as I understand, I mean, our outreach workers aren't medical professionals. Many of our outreach workers are peer recovery specialists who are from the communities that they serve. Uh, we work closely with Behavioral Health, Health System Baltimore, BHSB, who I see a representative here today. Um, and, um, and we have, our outreach workers are all throughout the, the city who are social workers, who are nurses, who are peer recovery specialists, who have no medical training whatsoever, and they're able to do this too. So I would say that if you're interested in, in further information about this, to please contact Leah, and, um, and, we'll, be, and, um, and we'll make sure to connect you so, so that you're able to, to distribute Narcan as well. One other question, if I may. Um, don't you think health departments throughout the state and public agencies throughout the state 
should have a supply of it on hand in the event an employee or a visitor collapses in the, which frequently happens. I absolutely do. Um, actually, we are, I would love to have Narcan available in every public space as we do defibrillators. I mean, I wanted to have it not only available in, um, in hospitals, but also in libraries and, you know, street alleys. I mean, I want this to be everywhere because everyone can save a life. And actually, I should mention that between um, October of 2015 and now, because of the work of everyday residents, not, not counting the work that paramedics and EMTs and police officers have done as our first responders, everyday residents have saved the lives of 1,500 other residents in Baltimore City because of how widespread this is. Our limitation now is cost because we simply can't purchase enough, Nar we don't have the resources to purchase Narcan for all these spaces. But I absolutely agree with you. Other questions? Folks have? Okay. I'll follow the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wen. Um, you mentioned housing at the beginning of your talk, and I had a question about homelessness in Baltimore. Um, last weekend was the first code blue of the season. and It was know, not. Oh, it was not the first code blue of the nope. season? Oh, okay. Well, I apologize. <laughs> it was a code blue. <laughs> it was not the code. It was not a code blue. Oh, but I, sorry oh, to, okay. to interrupt. Yes. I apologize. Um, well, in any event, I know that during code blue, um, access to shelter is expanded. Um, but for a lot of people, there are still barriers to getting into that shelter. And I was wondering about your thoughts of how the health infrastructure and the public health infrastructure could respond to that. I know in other cities, emergency rooms are open so that people can stay overnight. I don't know if there's anything happening like that in Baltimore. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And um, housing and, and um, as I talked about, housing is very much part of, of, of health care. And some of our most vulnerable individuals are individuals experiencing homelessness. And talk about stigma and misconception and what faces and the challenges that face our, our, our populations experiencing homelessness. So I'll get to it. Let me clarify about Code Blue. The code, so Code Blue is declared by the health commissioner. And I have not declared a Code Blue. So in this, in, I know. <laughs> so there are very few things that I know for certain. That one I know for, that one I know for certain. But um, it was cold, though, last, last, last weekend. Um, our um, statutes in Baltimore City set the temperature for Code Blue fairly low, so that I declare a code blue when it's very cold. I mean, basically when it's 13 degrees, or I mean, when it's very cold, or if there are other extreme weather conditions. Code blue in our city is not, it, it triggers a whole level of responses that include sheltering, but sheltering is not done through the health department. It's done through the mayor's office of, of human services. And I mention this because cold weather planning and code blue are very are separate things, right? I think that even when you don't get to those extremely cold temperatures, people still have difficulties with, with, with sheltering. It's not just that when you reach that 13 degrees or extreme weather that people have difficulties with, with, with sheltering. So the mayor, uh, Mayor Pew, recently re uh, re released a plan around homelessness. And I believe that she and the, and the mayor's office of human service are working towards a a plan for um, for uh, for for housing first and other types of policies that I think are important. Other questions down here? Um, I've been following you. You've been on NPR, and I just think you're wonderful. Um, <laughs> there's one issue that I think kind of falls, uh, maybe has fallen under the radar, and it's the <clears throat> excuse me, the prevalence of cervical cancer. Mm. Um, 77, there's a 77 percent increase, or I think African American women are 77 percent more likely than Caucasian women to die of cervical cancer. Um, and the HPV vaccination, I, I'm, I'm just not understanding why so many people are fighting it. And if the vaccination coupled with <coughs> maybe some other public health issues that African-American women are, are facing, if those two components are really the, the, the crux of why so many African-American women hmm. are falling victim. Thank you for mentioning this, because I actually I haven't heard, um, 
haven't heard a question about cervical cancer in quite some time. And I think it's important that we, that we talk about it. And um, I want to actually tie this to my, my response to the last question, because you'll notice that I didn't really give you an answer. <laughs> but I didn't, and I saw your face. Um, my, my face is also very expressive, so, you know, this is um, <laughs> it's what it is. But, um, but, you know, we don't, currently in the Baltimore City Health Department, we lost our funding for all cancer-related screening, education, screening, et cetera. And so this is an issue that is important to me because it has to be. You know, when, when we talk about public health and what is causing poor health outcomes or disparities, it's something that I have to think about. But I have no funding to, to address it and no services that I can provide. Um, so I'd love to think through with you about how we can leverage our partners. I mean, this is something that our hospitals and healthcare systems and federally qualified health, health system, uh, health centers, all of our and insurance companies, this is something that they should care about. I don't have direct ability to influence it, or I don't have direct ability to deliver those services. However, we can work together to work with our partners to get the results that we need. And to answer your question too, because homeless services and housing doesn't fall under the health department, this is not something that I can say, I'm going to change the policy today. But I can say that I understand where you're coming from and that it's something that we as a city need to focus on and that I then need to work with our partners who do have this in their jurisdiction, their sphere of influence to be able to address. I think this brings us to the broader question, you know, because as you heard, the, the, um, the work of the health department ends up being so broad we could end up being about everything, but we can't be, because if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. And we always have to operate under our sphere of influence. And so, unfortunately, it's like rationing Narcan, right? I mean, you have to decide every day about what are the issues that are the most pressing that we can make a difference in right now. Glasses, infant mortality, overdose are some of the examples of things that I chose as things that we have to make an impact on and that, that we have the ability to influence down. Cervical cancer, cancer screenings, homeless services, I would love to. <coughs> not as easy to influence within that, within that sphere. You, you're nodding more than before, so I appreciate it. <laughs> we have another question back here. Um, yeah, I just had a question for you, kind of along the same lines that you were speaking about with the previous question, but I, I recently learned that in the U.S., women's life expectancy is <coughs> decreasing, and that you now have a better life expectancy if you were born in 1935 than in 1995. And I wonder if that is somewhat related to what you were just talking about that, or if there are other factors around violence and a number of other issues that are contributing to that. Um. I don't know the exact statistic. That doesn't quite sound right, you know, just um, as a... a, a okay. <laughs> well, I don't know the exact statistic about, about 35 versus 95 in that comparison, but I will say that for the first time, I do understand our statistics to be that for the first time in our, in our history that the leading cause of death for... Um, for um, for quite a few age groups, I'm, I'm, I don't want to, 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 to miss school, but for quite a few age groups are these diseases of despair. The overdose, suicide, right, the, these, the, 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 these diseases of despair. And um, there was a study that I want to re relay about this, and I'm not going to say it exactly right, but the, the, the gist of it I think you'll understand. When people were looking at where it is that there are the highest rates of these, um, these d d diseases of despair with addiction and suicide and overdose and so forth. They found that those same areas also overlapped with areas with very high poverty, unemployment, homelessness, housing instability. I mean, you can go on and on and you'll, you see what I mean, that these are the same areas where people see tomorrow as no better than today and maybe they're not using opioids or whatever to treat a physical pain, but they're using it to treat something else. And I think that, to your point, I mean, there's, 
that element of it and the overdose and disease of despair that are contributing to a decrease in life expectancy, I think also that we don't do as good of a job of focusing on the longer term because that's not, people don't see the cost of doing nothing. I heard someone say too that the face, that there is no face of public health, right? That public health saved your life today, you just don't know it. Because how do you prove something that didn't happen? I mean, there's the face of someone who got sick in a restaurant, but what about the restaurant inspection we did to prevent that person from getting sick in the first place? Or there's the face of someone who was shot, but what about the kid who could have gotten shot if not for the educational interventions and early literacy and early childhood. I mean, there's no face of that. And so I think that as we look to tackle these longer term issues like life expectancy, we also have to think about where those early investments are, are, are going to be. And we haven't, as a society, we don't do a good job of painting the face of public health. And I would say of social work and the work that you all do too, right? You're preventing something from happening. But what, how do you show that thing that could have happened if not for the intervention that you did in order to help that child um, in, um, and that family thrive? Another question here. Thank you for taking my question. I recently read that Baltimore City has $12 million for youth services. My question is, given that I think in a social systems kind of way, what role, if any, will the health department have in interventions which this money will be spent? Because I get the impression that some folks are thinking narrowly, uh, and if you don't have a role, uh, why not? It's um, a very difficult question to answer. Um, as I understand it, this is a youth fund that was um, that um, that Council President Young is overseeing. Um, I believe that President or that Council Pre Pre President Young's intention for the youth fund is that it should go towards new programs and initiatives and that are not city government initiatives. So I do not have a role in this in the um, in, 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 in the dissemination of this funding, but I believe that that's by design because I think that youth fund is meant to be something outside of what city government is doing already. So, question over here. Um, if we're calling out structural racism as a problem in terms of public health and health outcomes, what is the health department doing um, in terms of um, starting upstream with policies towards changing structural racism from a healthcare perspective? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. <laughs> So my honest answer, because we're friends now after <laughs> our many other um, responses, but um, my honest answer is I don't know. And that I'm trying to figure this out. Because you know, when, um, when we designed, we put together a blueprint for health in our city because we, it was time for our strategic planning. I have to start with a plan. Um, we called it Healthy Baltimore 2020. And the aim of Healthy Baltimore 2020 was to identify the areas where we can make the biggest difference, where there are the biggest challenges, and set out our, our, our direction. And then when I saw this, it actually hit me right as this was going to print. So my team loved this, right? That it was like right as this was going to print that I, that, that I said, we can't submit this plan as it is because it doesn't address disparities. And if we're not being honest about racial disparities, if we're not being honest about geographic disparities, then we can't really make, we can't put out this plan in this city without recognizing that we have to do something about disparities. But then we took it one step further and said, but what are the implicit biases that we may have? If we don't address the implicit biases and start looking at all of our work from a race equity inclusion standpoint, then if we're not doing this ourselves as a team, and then our programs and the way that we design our programs are going to, to reflect that. So we're actually going through a whole process now of answering, of trying to answer exactly what, 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 what you're addressing. And we're starting at least the very basics of what we're doing are two things. The first is to specifically say that our Healthy Baltimore plan is not just about improving health outcomes. 
it's specifically calling out reducing disparities. That's the first part. And the second thing is we are working on putting the race equity inclusion framework on, on what we're doing. I don't know how it's going because it's something that we're just starting. And so therefore I can't really answer your question because I don't know. But I, I, I would welcome your thoughts and, and, and input into this as we're navigating what is an uncomfortable place to be, but an incredibly important place to be too. That's the